This video is designed to introduce the divergence theorem, otherwise known as Gauss's law. The main topics to be covered by this video are what is a closed surface, what is the divergence theorem, the meaning of the term divergence, and then some examples using the divergence theorem. A closed surface. S is a closed surface if it bounds a solid region in space. One way to think about this is can it hold air? Examples of closed surfaces would include things like spheres or cubes. Things which are not closed surfaces would be, say, a circular or elliptic paraboloid. Because if we look at the graph of a circular or elliptic paraboloid, just one running along the z-axis, so let's just say z equals x squared plus y squared. Notice the top's open. So it's not bounding a solid region. Now, if your surface was composed of two pieces, one which was the circular paraboloid and the other which was part of the plane, say z equal two, the cap or the circular part of the plane which would comprise the lid to your bowl shape, then that would be a closed surface. But a circular paraboloid by itself or a cone or a circular cylinder are not closed surfaces. The divergence theorem, or Gauss's law, says let E be a solid region and let S be the piecewise smooth boundary surface of E given with positive or outward orientation. Let F be a vector field whose component functions have continuous partial derivatives on an open region that contains E. Then the surface integral of the vector field is equivalent to the triple integral of the divergence of F dV. So, in other words, under certain conditions, the flux of f across the boundary surface of E is equal to the triple integral of the divergence of f over E. Now remember, the divergence of a vector field is a scalar function. So the divergence of f, or del dot f, was just equal to the partial derivative of the first component with respect to x, plus the partial derivative of the second component with respect to y, plus the partial derivative of the third component with respect to z, where your vector field f, we're saying, has components p, q, and r. Therefore, you're taking the triple integral of a scalar function. Now, all of the theorems from this course have in common that they're relating the derivative of a function over a region to the integral of the original function over the boundary. Let's talk about the meaning of divergence. In fluid flow, it measures the tendency of a fluid to diverge from a point. It's a measure of the net rate of outflow or outward flux per unit volume at each point, or another way to think about it is flux density. We call a vector field incompressible if the divergence of the vector field equals zero. So if the divergence of the vector field at a point equals zero, then F is neither a sink or a source, it's incompressible at P. This doesn't mean, for instance, in fluid flow, that no fluid is flowing into the point, but it means the amount flowing in is equivalent to the amount flowing out, as in our third picture down here. So the net rate of outflow would be zero at that point. If the divergence of F at a point is greater than zero, net flow is outward near P, and P is called a source. So the vectors going into the point are smaller than the vectors coming out. If the divergence of f at a point p is less than zero, net flow is inward near p, and p is called a sink. So the vectors going in are bigger than the vectors going out. For this first example, part A asks, are the points p1 and p2 sources or sinks for the vector field f shown in the picture below, and explain. So the divergence of f at point p1, it looks like the vectors going in are smaller than the vectors coming out. So the net rate of outflow is positive, or the divergence of f at p1 is greater than zero, and p1 is a source. The divergence of f at p2, well, it looks like the vectors going in are bigger than the vectors coming out. So the net rate of outflow is less than zero, and p2 is called a sink. Part b says, given the vector field f, which we have the picture of here, it's got components x and y squared, 
use the definition of divergence to verify your answers to part A. So the divergence of the vector field is going to be equal to the partial derivative of the first component with respect to x, so 1, plus the partial derivative of the second component with respect to y, which is 2y. Divergence of f is equal to 0 when 1 plus 2y equals 0 when y equals minus 1 half. Somewhere in here, at y equals negative 1 half, the vectors going into these points are the same length as the vectors coming out. Now, if y is greater than negative 1 half, then divergence of f is greater than 0, and you have sources. So p1 would be a source. And if y is less than negative 1 half, then 1 plus 2y would be less than 0, so the divergence of f is less than 0, and you would have sinks just as we conjectured P2 was a sink. Example 2 asks us to find the outward flux of a vector field F across the surface of the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 9 for z greater than or equal to 0 less than or equal to 2, including its top and bottom disks. So your surface S is actually comprised of three pieces. You have your circular cylinder, We'll call that S1, which has the equation x squared plus y squared equals 9. And then you have surface 2, which is this capital on the bottom. And that's part of the plane z equals 0. And then you've got this surface 3, which is the capital on the top, which is part of the plane z equal 2. Therefore, your surface S is a closed surface. You're actually enclosing a region E in space, and we can use the divergence there. So if you were to calculate the surface integral of the vector field directly, you would have to calculate the surface integral over each of the pieces and add them all together. We did a problem fairly similar to this at the end of the video on surface integrals of vector fields. So please refer to that if you would like to see the surface integral or one very similar to this calculated directly. But since S is a closed surface, we can use the divergence here. And instead of calculating the surface integral directly, we do the triple integral of the divergence of the vector field over the region E enclosed by the surface. First off, the divergence of the vector field would be the partial derivative of the first component with respect to x. That's going to be z plus the partial derivative of the second component with respect to y. That will be z plus the partial derivative of the third component with respect to z. So altogether, we have 2z. Therefore, our surface integral is the triple integral over e of 2z dv. Now, this is a triple integral like any other you calculated in Calc 3. You can calculate it directly doing x, y, or z first, depending upon the problem, or you can switch to cylindrical coordinates, or you can switch to spherical coordinates if appropriate. In this case, since our boundary is a circular cylinder, it would make sense to switch to cylindrical coordinates. And S1 in cylindrical coordinates is r squared equals 9 or r equals 3. So we have the triple integral of 2z dv in cylindrical coordinates is r dz dr d theta. z goes from 0 to 2, r goes from 0 to 3, and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. If we look at the projection of our solid region onto the xy plane, it's going to be the interior of the circle x squared plus y squared equals 9, or r equals 3. So just like in polar, r goes from 0 to 3, you want the whole circle, so theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Now it's just a matter of evaluating the triple integral. So we've got the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 3, of z squared r from 0 to 2 dr d theta. So we are going to have the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 3 of 4r dr d theta, or the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 2r squared from 0 to 3 d theta. So the integral from 0 to 2 pi of it looks like 18 d theta. It's going to be 18 theta from 0 to 2 pi, 
or 36 pi. And that's our final answer. Example three asks us to find the flux of F through the surface S, the cube with vertices plus or minus one, plus or minus one, plus or minus one. So if we draw the cube to the best of our ability, our axes go right through the middle of this guy. So that, for instance, is a point one, one, one. We're asked to find the flux through S. So the flux is equal to the surface integral over S of the vector field. Now S in this case is this cube, so it's actually made up of six pieces corresponding to the six sides. So if you were to calculate the surface integral directly, you would actually have to calculate six surface integrals and add them together. But luckily for us, the divergence theorem says instead we can do the triple integral over the solid region bounded by the cube of the divergence of the vector field. Now you may say, what about the orientation? You're not told to define the outward flux or that as the surface has an outward orientation. But with closed surfaces, you can assume, even if it's not specified, that you're talking about an outward or positive orientation for the surface. That's always the default unless you're told otherwise for closed surfaces. So in this case, the divergence of the vector field okay, going to be the partial derivative of the first component of f or x with respect to x, which is one, partial derivative of the second component or two y with respect to y, which is two, plus the partial derivative of the, the third component with respect to z or three. So the divergence of f is just equal to six. So flux is gonna be the triple integral of six over the solid region E bounded by your surface S. Now you can integrate with respect to x, y, or z first. It doesn't really matter. So for instance, you could write this as six dz dy dx, where z goes from minus one to one, as does y, as does x. However, it might be a little faster if you notice that this is six times the triple integral over e of one dv, or six times the volume of e. So in that case, you've got six, the length of each of the sides is two. So six times two times two times two, or 48. And that's your final answer. Example four says use the divergence theorem to evaluate the surface integral of the vector field F, where S is the boundary of the solid formed by z equals the square root of four minus x squared minus y squared, z equals the square root of one minus x squared minus y squared, and z equals zero. And your vector field F is given as the first component's x cubed plus y sine z, the second component's y cubed plus z sine x, and the third component's three x. So let's give ourselves some axes here. So our surface is actually made up of multiple pieces. The first is this z equals the square root of four minus x squared minus y squared. That's actually a hemisphere, the top half of a sphere. The second surface is z equals the square root of one minus x squared minus y squared. So the second surface is a hemisphere, the top half of a sphere, radius one, centered at the origin. And then on bottom, you're bounded by part of the xy plane, or z equals zero. So this flat donut region in the xy plane, between where the spheres intersect the xy plane, is part of z equals zero, or is the cap on the bottom. So your outer sphere is the part of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals four, where z is greater than or equal to zero. And your inner sphere, this red sphere, is the part of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one, the part where z is greater than or equal to zero. And then you're bounded below by this flat donut region, which is part of z equals zero, the xy plane. Now we're using the divergence theorem to evaluate the surface integral of the vector field. Again, if you're gonna do this directly, the surface is actually comprised of three pieces. 
But since we were talking about a closed surface, we're enclosing this region in space. Think about this as being an orange where you dig out the middle of it. And so we're integrating over, say, the orange rind where we've taken a, a circular chunk out of the middle of half of our orange. So we have a closed surface, so we can use the divergence theorem, and the surface integral is going to be the triple integral over the solid region bounded by that surface of the divergence of the vector field. Again, we can assume, even though it's not specified, that we're talking about an outward or a positive orientation on the surface. That's the default for closed surfaces. So we need to calculate the divergence of the vector field. It's going to be the partial derivative of the first component with respect to x is 3x squared. The partial derivative of the second component with respect to y is 3y squared plus 0. And the partial derivative of the third component with respect to z is just 0. So the surface integral will be the triple integral over e of 3x squared plus 3y squared dv. Once we evaluate the triple integral, remember we can switch to cylindrical or spherical coordinates if it's more convenient. In this case, our surface is comprised of spheres, so it might be nice to switch to spherical coordinates. The outer sphere and spherical coordinates is rho squared equals 4, rho equals 2, and the inner sphere and spherical coordinates is rho squared equals 1 or rho equals 1. So this is equal to, we've got 3 and x in spherical is rho sine phi cosine theta quantity squared plus 3 y in spherical is rho sine phi sine theta quantity squared dv in spherical is rho squared sine phi and then we have d rho d phi d theta rho is going from if we imagine a ray going up diagonally through the middle of our solid region. It enters on rho equals 1, it enters on the outer sphere rho equals 2. If we think about the angles that ray can make with the positive z-axis, it can go all the way from 0 to pi over 2. And then if you look at the projection down onto the xy plane, it's going to be that donut region. Theta is the angle from polar coordinates, so the angle that rays in that projected region in the xy plane would make with the positive x-axis. And since we want the whole circle in the donut region, theta would go from 0 to 2 pi. Now we just need to simplify and integrate this. So our surface integral is going to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 2, the integral from 1 to 2 of, we had, 3, and then we had rho squared sine squared phi, and if we factor it out, this is times the quantity cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. Then from dv, we still have rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. So this is going to equal the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 2, the integral from 1 to 2, Cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is, of course, 1. So we've got 3 rho to the fourth sine cubed phi d rho d phi d theta. Now that we've simplified, we can start integrating. So this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 3 rho to the fifth over 5 sine cubed phi from 1 to 2 d phi d theta. This is going to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 2, so 93 fifths sine cubed phi d phi d theta. The next step is to integrate sine cubed phi, and we do that using a trick substitution. So this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 93 fifths and we write it as sine squared phi times sine phi d phi d theta. Why we do that is because we can rewrite sine squared phi as well cosine squared phi plus sine squared phi equals 1. So sine squared phi would be 1 minus cosine squared phi. 
Anytime you're integrating sine or cosine by themselves raised to an odd power, you use this trig substitution. So we would write it as the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 2, of 1 minus cosine squared phi times sine phi d phi d theta. The reason we do that is we can then do a u substitution. We can let u be cosine phi, so du is minus sine phi d phi. And we can integrate. So this would be the integral. I'm going to clear off some room here, erase my note. This would be the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 93 fifths. And we'd have, well, the antiderivative of sine phi is minus cosine phi. And the antiderivative for minus cosine squared phi times sine phi using my u substitution would be cosine cubed phi over 3. And I'm going to put in my bounds, 0 to pi over 2. So if I evaluate my at my bounds, this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 93 fifths times 0, cosine of pi over 2 is 0, minus 93 fifths times, well, cosine of 0 is 1, so we've got minus 1 plus 1 third d theta. Therefore, we've got the integral from 0 to 2 pi of it looks like, so we've got 93 fifths times 2 thirds d theta. So let's see, that's going to be 31 times 2. 31 times 2 is 62 over 5 theta from 0 to 2 pi. So that's going to be 62 times 2 pi. That's 124 pi over 5, and that's my final answer. If you're just told to set this up, you could stop here. You just have to get it to the point where you can integrate it in terms of one of the coordinate systems. Example 5, we're asked to find the inward flux where S is the surface of the tetrahedron bounded by the planes x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0, and x plus 2y plus z equal 2. So that's going to intersect the x-axis at 2, the y-axis, or the z-axis rather, at 2, excuse me, and the y-axis at 1. So my surface here is actually made up of four separate pieces. This front piece I have colored in is part of our plane x plus 2y plus z equal 2. The back is part of the plane x equals 0. The left side is part of the plane y equals 0. And the bottom is part of the plane z equals 0. So I'm asked to find the inward flux. So that's going to be the surface integral over S, which if you calculate it directly, by the way, would comprise four separate surface integrals. So instead, what I want to do is find a way to use the divergence here. Now we have to be careful here because we're asked to find the inward flux. So the divergence theorem applies directly to the outward flux, or an outward oriented surface. So if S were outward oriented, let's call it S out, then the surface integral over a closed surface is equal to the triple integral over the solid region bounded by the surface of the divergence of F. But we want S to be what we're given, which is an inward oriented surface. Well, I can find the corresponding surface integral where s is inward oriented by just multiplying by a negative 1. It just changes the orientation of all those unit normals. So minus the surface integral of s out of your vector field, or minus the triple integral over e of the divergence of the vector field, is equivalent to our surface integral where we have the inward orientation. So therefore, if we want to find flux, it's going to be minus the triple integral over e of the divergence of the vector field. In this case, the divergence of my vector field is going to be, well, it looks like we've got 2xy plus 2xy plus 2xy, or just 6xy. So therefore, flux is going to be minus the triple integral 
of 6xy. In this case, I would stick with rectangular coordinates and integrate with respect to z first. So z is going to, if you imagine a ray coming up through the middle of your solid, it would enter on the plane z equals 0, and it would exit on this plane, which is z equals 2 minus x minus 2y. So to find the x and y bounds, we look at the projection on the xy plane. It's bounded by a piece of the x-axis, a piece of the y-axis, and this line of intersection where there, your plane x plus 2y plus z equal 2 intersects z equals 0. So it's this triangular region here. That's bounded by part of the x-axis, part of the y-axis, and where 0 equals 2 minus x minus 2y or x equals 2 minus 2y. So if I do x next, x goes from 0 to 2 minus 2y. And finally, then y goes from 0 to 1. Now, if you're just asked to set the integral up, you can stop here. But we're asked to calculate it, so we've got a little bit of work to do. To find the inward flux, we now need to calculate the negative of the triple integral of 6xy dz dx dy, where z is going from 0 to 2 minus x minus 2y, where x is going from 0 to 2 minus 2y, and where y is going from 0 to 1. We're going to calculate it directly, starting with z. So this is going to be equal to minus the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from 0 to 2 minus 2y of 6xyz. And we're going to put in the bounds, so 0 to 2 minus x minus 2y dx dy. Or this is going to be or minus the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from 0 to 2 minus 2y of 6xy times the quantity 2 minus x minus 2y. We still have dx dy. So this is going to give us minus the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from 0 to 2 minus 2y, 12xy minus 6x squared y minus 12xy squared dx dy. And now we're going to integrate with respect to x. So we'll have minus the integral from 0 to 1 of 6x squared y minus 2x cubed y minus, that's going to be 6x squared y squared from 0 to 2 minus 2y dy. Or this is going to equal minus the integral from 0 to 1 of 6 times the quantity 2 minus 2y squared times y minus 2 times the quantity 2 minus 2y cubed times y minus 6 times the quantity 2 minus 2y squared times y squared dy. Now if we multiply this out and combine like terms, we should get to minus the integral from 0 to 1 of 8y minus 24y squared plus 24y cubed minus 8y to the fourth dy. And if we integrate with respect to y, this is going to be minus, and we'll have 4y squared minus 8y cubed plus 6y to the fourth minus 8 fifths y to the fifth. If we plug in the bounds, that goes from 0 to 1. Or this is minus, let's see, we have 4 minus 8 plus 6. So 2 minus 8 fifths, that is negative 2 fifths.
And that's our final answer.